Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, um, my talk today is about the very uh, like hot topic all over the world, like how the Chinese currency is internationalizing, and the um, Chinese government really pushed a lot on that, and they saw a lot of like uh, benefits from U.S. dollar to be the international currency so but i'm trying to use a different uh, like alternative cur currency theory to uh, interpret the how chinese can internationalizing their currency so it's called a sovereign currency approach to internationalizing of the rmb I, I think maybe randy already talking a lot about the sovereign currency approach so I, I won't focus that much on that theory, but I mostly focus on Chinese side. Um, so during this presentation, I'm gonna give, uh, try to uh, cover those topics. First one, I'm trying to give a brief, brief overview of the current economic situation of China, so how the Chinese economy look like now. And then second is about theory. Third is exchange rate regions and the policy space. Like what kind of exchange rate region related to the policy space? And the third is if Chinese currency really be uh, the international reserve currency, how how they can get benefit or more responsibilities arose from that. Um, so, and the last one is about if. Chinese want, really want their currency to be internationalizing. So is there any preconditions and responsibilities among there? Uh, so first day is about the general idea of the Chinese economy. So for China, they all say, oh, they have the miracle growth in the past 40 years. Since the, with, this year is the important year for China. Uh, because we have the open reform policy since 1978. So this year is like a 40 years anniversary. So people were like, at the beginning of this year, they were like so excited, oh, this is already 40 years. But now it's the middle of the year. People were so scared. Because if by the end of the year, they will have the celebration about the open, open reform, like Chinese the former president already uh, had that kind of idea, but they're a little scared now because a lot of a lot of the the data shows the economy doesn't go as they wanted. So it's a little bit scary this year for Chinese. And but anyway, during the past forty years, we have the unprecedented sustained and rapid growth, rapid growth. And then th those are mostly fueled by the investment. The investment rate is very high, but there is still some question about how, like we already have like 40 years growth, can the growth sustainable? So there's a lot of question about that. So related to that question, the first one is like the debt problems. So the, on, the very worried debt problem now is about real, real estate sector. So a lot of people, goes to, the house price goes up, and a lot of people goes into the debts and to try to buy houses. It's not the people, it's not the household. Not only the household, but also the companies. They, don't, they think the only thing that can help them earn money is to build houses and sell houses. So they don't do anything else except to borrow money and to build a house and to sell houses. Uh, which is a little, I will mention later, which is a little complicated to understand uh, for the foreigners because they have some inside things so hard. And also we have the shadow banking bubble. I was writing a few papers on that. And, but um, since this year, a lot of shadow banking they were good because they always they have the shadow like lending, but the banks always sit standing behind them. They can always get money to clear their debts. But this year, there are few there are few uh, things happen. Their shadow banking cannot serve their debts. So that's one thing that make people scared. 
The third is like um, a government, a shaky government of finances. So it's especially about the local government. It's local government borrow mo the most money, and then they were like cannot get any finance anymore. <laughs> Some of them go bankrupt. So that's a problem. And the, the fifth is, does China have the policy space to deal with the potential problems? The, the, in the mainstream idea, people think, oh, China has a really critical year this year. Maybe they couldn't deal with that problem. But based on our money approach, we, we can tell later like, what kind of like, policy spaces we can use. And uh, how can China uh, preserve and enhance policy space? Those are all based on the different idea about the money theory. Uh, for the real East Bubble, I just mentioned a little bit. Uh, I'm not doing that much research on this side, but I read a lot of articles. So people said, oh, there is real East Bubbles. Like some cities, they're house prices is really high, and some cities, their house prices is, is, is like a casino. You, they, they are restricted by the government. You cannot buy the houses, and then you need to get into a market and do like a gamble. Like they open a few, a few real estate spots, and you need to get in and to see, to get the bid on that. If you, you put your like ID number in, the, the machine will roll really quick and they pick up which one can buy the houses. Because they, they were, I don't know, I think they must be have something behind it. Like local government go bankrupt, they don't have money, but they want to support those real, real estate company. So they just design this kind of mechanism for people to buy houses. So like I knew a few friends who are like, they already have a lot of houses. And they were afraid the house price was going up again, but they can't. They, they cannot buy anymore. And they they use other people's ID and try to get into those kind of mechanisms to drive the house price going up. So it's very complicated. I also have some friends, university pre professors in other university who are my good friends, and they were um they were doing research on real estate bubble. I. Honestly, I sold my house the beginning of the last, the end of last year, my old one, and I bought a new one, which is in the compass. But before I sold one, that one, I was asking her, said, oh, could I sell the house now? Is the house price going, still going up and going down? And for the research set, they said, oh, it goes up with like 30% already in the, like three months. So maybe it's a good time for you to sell. So I sold it. And I went to U.S. I had my best life there. And when I got back to U.S. to China, the hospital price goes up like another fifty percent. So, so, so you don't. I for people all think, oh, there must be a lot of demands for the house. I don't believe. Like two years ago, all the houses empty because they have a lot of report, a lot of analysis, a lot of research on why so many houses are empty. And then there's. And now there's no electricity. So I'm thinking, like two years later, so the demand can go up like crazy, and all the houses sold out, and the people trying to buy the, like a corporate, like a company trying to buy, like a, a very expensive land to build a house on that. So I just, I'm not sure. It's so complicated. It must have some garment getting to it, and they combine together with the, real estate company or whatever. It's so hard to understand if you're not an inside person. So, but anyway, if you ask me if there are any real estate bubble, I don't, I don't know how to answer this question, but people all think Chinese economy are fueled by the real estate house price because it's too much investment in there. So I don't know. And there are also high corporate debts like fueling the investment GDP, but what happened if it grows slow? That means since this year, I actually not this year, since last year, the central government is really worried. The, the main issue of the central government is how to deleverage. Like the deleverage is like a key issue all over China. So how the most important thing is the cooperative debts 
going back, going before. That's the problem. And also have other debts. That's corporate that goes default. And that related to the bank, um, the bank loans going back too. So that's the problem. And um, there's a lot of growth as shadow banking, like P2P, mutual funds, ISAVs, and internet finance. Those are things that have the default rates getting really high in this past half year. But I don't have the, because those data are hidden. So you cannot really get those data. Um, but, but the shadow banking grows really, really fast in the past 10 years. I, I actually wrote a few uh, articles on them, uh, tried to find out how those shadow banking work in China. What is their mechanism? How they borrow, how they lend, how they get people in. I wrote a paper on that. Uh, but most people think, oh, this is a good thing, like mainstream thing. They're a good thing because they can help to elude the government registry, and then they can have, because in China, the big banks have a lot of competition, like advantages than other things. So they, they say, oh, this is not fair. So if you go do the shadow banking thing, sometimes those shadow banking thing is not like shadow bank. There are banks doing shadow, and they are trying to support because their balance sheet was limited by the government. So like, you cannot lend too much, you cannot create too much debt. So the banks has to go to the shadow banking part. They don't report their lendings or their debts into their balance sheet. So that's the thing, because they think is there is unfair competitions. Like big banks can do things, and the small and little bank cannot. So there is that. And all, those all causing the rising fragility, because like, I think it's last year our formal governor of central bank mentioned uh, on the, the committee party annual conference in China, which is very very important. One said, "Oh, China, we have to work, we have to be cautious about Chinese uh, financial system fragility that may cause the Minsky moment." So he mentioned, he really mentioned, and people all over the world started focus on, "Oh, Chinese." China gonna go to the get to the Minsky moment, so they that's that's why. Another thing is the local government debt, um, because there's a lot of imbalance between central government and local government. So central government has the power and the more tax revenue, more money to do things, more policy space to do things, but local government has to borrow to do things. And in China, there's sort of like, you know, like every every province they have a governor. The governor was picketed by the central government, so they have to compete with each other. So they have to compete. Oh, my city or my province and the economic growth rate is better than yours, and then they then they can get better chance to go to the central government. Those governors, so they were like compete all the time. So. How they can compete that, the most thing, important thing is the local government economic growth. So they don't, they don't worry about how much debt they get it into, but they worry about can they go into other higher position or get promoted, whatever. So, it's, so in China, all the economy should, I always call that a political economy, always related to political issues. You cannot avoid it. Okay. Um, and this is uh, the changes of the investment on real estate in China. So, you, um, so the investment is going really high. It's like this is the data like shows some like formal data. There's still something you cannot collect, it, but you can tell the investment is going up really high and the real estate going up. But you can tell here in 2015 the 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 real estate investment is not high, and people by then will worry about the real estate will bank the will default, and then all houses cannot be sold out. Uh, so much worry, and only two years later it goes change. So we don't know what happened.
And this is Chinese uh, cooperative that uh, compared to other countries, you can tell the cooperative that it's almost way over 150. So it's a lot higher than other countries. And this is the central government deficit. This is including a transfer to the local government. So that's what the, looks like a local, central government deficit. Um, you can tell in the crisis period it goes up, but then pretty steady. And then this one is the one that called central government physical deficit as a percent of GDP. Um, this uh, is excluding a transfer to local government. And then we can tell the central government actually in surplus, not deficit. And then central government debt by percent of GDP. Um, they're growing, but um, it's it's not over twenty percent. That's central government debt. So this one is the local government physical uh, deficit to GDP in China. Um, you know the local government physical deficit is they don't. Yeah, they have the they have the website. They have the balance sheet. You, this is from a formal data, but they are um, they they have different like a debt platform. We call uh, like local government debt platform, something like that. It's like they they created the company, and this company is just have, because local government can only have the like limited debts. And they created a company, and this company just helped the local government to get into the debts. Those are the, they, they, they hide it, so you don't know how much. But those people were, uh, have some, uh, uh, some kind of like estimate or guesses on the local government uh, physical, not physical debts, on the local government debts. Um, they were saying, this one we said is less than 30% or whatever, but they were seeing uh, local government, some very like um, famous economists in China, they do like guess or estimate of the local government debt. They said maybe it's over 50 or 60% of the GDP. <laughs> but I, I don't have the formal data, so I cannot show. This is all from the 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 website of China's formal data. Um, so look, you can from all those graphs, you can tell there's problems at the local level. Um, so first, central government can spend that issue its own currency. Central government that won't create the solvency risk for China. That's when we, we call sovereign currency. And the problem is unequal development among east, middle, and the west of the China. So there's a lot of unequal development. Like the east is a more like uh, U.S. It's very developed, and the middle and the west is less less developed. So they, they the, the government has to do something to do with that. So the local government needs more income first to be big. Be before it can spend. They're not a currency issuer. And too much responsibility is putting on them. High local government debt growth. That's the very, very key issue that happened in China now. It's like very high local government. Like I mentioned, they didn't disclose it, but everybody's so worried. Everybody's so worried. The central government share of tax revenue is too high relative to spending. You don't spend too much, it goes to surplus. The local government goes way to deficit. Um, so for that, we have some long-run implications for China. So first, China shift more spending to central government. Central government should spend more. And China will continue to shift the source of growth away from investment and export, but towards the consumption. Now, actually, we've been doing this for like five to ten years, like trying to shift the, we call that 
reform the fin uh, reform the economic growth structure. That's what we call uh, try to let people to consume more domestically or not just uh, invest to invest. But the problem is people all worry about where I can consume. What should I consume? So they focus on the real estate. They, they try to buy houses. <laughs> That's this, I don't know. Is this conceptual or not? And so they must avoid the debt-based conception. Apparently, it's not for now. And all this implies greater reliance on central physical power. So, what central government should do about those things? They only constrained. Like for central government power is the managed exchange rate. So in China, our exchange rate system is managed exchange rate. So I'll talk about that later. Um, so now we do the conclusion of this session, Chinese law. law. Uh, look, China will gradually transfer transition to floating exchange rate. Uh, it's very likely that Chinese cheap surplus will decline. It's actually already declined. But the problem is, they, they don't like that. They think that's not good for them because their economic growth is going down. So it's declined, but they don't like it. Especially central government, they don't like it. And they can, China can continue to pursue a robust growth and rise in the living standards with its own sovereign currency. That's from the sovereign currency theory. Fears of the Minsky moment is still there. So this year, last year they have fears, but this year they have more fears because the stock market is going really bad this whole year. They said, oh, might have the Minsky moment this year. So they always saying there's something happened. So China, but then China should avoid the excessive financialization of the economy. So I heard talk with Simone about the financialization of Brazil, and China still think that's a good thing. Yeah, they want to financial everything. They want to do like that over that and to securitization everything, and then they, they were trying to deal with the debt problems. Now we need to understand why China policy space is sufficient to ensure robot girls who are tackling any financial problems. So we have the policy space. Why? Let's see. So China have the domestic on uh, based on MMT with our domestic currency. Government and private sectors issue debts only denominated in the state money account. Only denominated to R and D, but only the central bank issue the domestic currency is um, and and then this currency is an obligation denominated in the state money of account issued by the government. So it can always hold parity against the money account. So you give the ten yuan to Chinese government, they always give you another ten yuan. So, however, government have alternative regarding external value. So those for domestic part, the currency can pay anything can have their uh, solid use. But for the external value, it depends on what kind of what kind of exchange rate region you have. So there's three. The one is patch. This is convertible. This makes the hard government have the least of policy space. And the second is manage. They have more policy space. The third is floating. This is most of policy space. Mm, uh, I'll go to the exchange rate later a little bit. And here we just do a little bit sectoral review, see how a Chinese sectoral uh, balance is. So there's the fundamental principles. Like for every surplus, there should have an equal deficit. I think Randy already taught that in the class. Okay, and then flows accumulate to stocks. If we sum the we sum the deficit run by one or more sector of economy, this must equal to the surplus run by number sectors. So the principal level can be like that. 
If the government run deficit, it must be equal to private surplus and and plus government account deficit, current account deficit. The government run surplus, this must have the private deficit and the current account surplus. For China and for US, it's quite different. It's the first one mostly, but for China, we have the government surplus, but now it's going down since the. American financial crisis. So um, Chinese government have a little bit, but not too much uh, deficit, and then it leads to the private surplus and a little bit government account surplus. Current account surplus. Let's say this. This is the the balance. Uh, this balance show the Chinese sectoral, uh, uh, like a mirror thing. You can tell the government sector runs a little bit surplus, almost four percent, and then a current account runs surplus too, four percent. So the total private sector runs a surplus, almost eight percent. This is the Chinese, almost this way. Um. So USA. Um. We know the USA ran a large trade current account deficit. That also they generally rising, and sustainable the private uh, appropriate for the issue of global reserve currency. Now we are going to talking about the global reserve currency. So why American can US can the dollar can be the international reserve currency because they always run a current and deficit and the growth. It's green, and the rest of the world can always have the dollar available. So that's one thing. And the China is, in other hand, runs a、uh, large surpluses. So, but this will fall as China modernized, but not too much so far. And、um, wages rise, and domestic consumption becomes the engine of growth. For every export, there must be an import, but. China will become too large to maintain current account surplus. They must import things. They too. They will become too large to maintain current account surplus. But for reasons we've discussed, the issue the international reserve currency is not consistent with current account surplus. If you can't have the current account surplus. And then you cannot let the rest of the world have your currencies. That's the problem. Okay, now let's go back to Minsky、um, to see、uh, what Minsky thought about this internationalization of the currency.、Uh, Minsky is best known for those like hypotheses, hypotheses that hedge speculative and how I think you guys all know that. But this plays a major role in Minsky's theory of evolution towards the fragility and to Minsky moment. So we're talking about based on the country level, what is the Ponzi country? What Minsky mentioned here. <clears throat> Minsky was on the intern external balance.、Uh, in his several pieces, Minsky used the four tiers approach to financial flows. The first two tiers they call the trade flows,、uh, including the、um, current imports, export goods and services, including the remittances, other invisibles, and the second is capital incomes. That's the receipts and expenditure due to income from the capital assets owned abroad. The third is about investment. It's about long-term private investment, like you invest abroad, like long-term. Private investment, and the the fourth tier is borrowing, like short-term debts or movement of international reserves among countries. That's the four tiers Minsky mentioned about external balance. Um. So how does this Minsky idea apply to the U.S.? Um. In the from the history in the 1960s, U.S. investment abroad. That's tier three we just mentioned. Offset the surplus of first two tiers because they American by then they have the surplus. 
but they have the the tier straight over the first two. So they they allowing the rest of the world to accumulate the short term U.S. dollar assets. And this was consistent with the dollar serving as the international reserve currency, as it ensure a steady supply of the dollar needed by the rest of the world, as reserved on Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate system. Back then, it was the Bretton Woods. However, after 1971, tier one as trade turned increasingly negative, and by 1977, exceeded the tier two surplus. So. Tier two is income from investment abroad. And Minsky argued, and so much short-term dollar abroad is threatened its status as international reserves. Because he invested outside so much um, short-term dollar debts abroad is threatened its uh, status as international reserve. And he argued that tier one deficit must be reduced to equal to tier two surplus. That's his idea. Minsky uh, doubted that depreciation of the dollar could achieve a balance, but those are mainly cited by mainstream. I think depreciation would achieve the balance. But in any sense, he argued the smooth adjustment to currency depreciation would work only in the world which finance doesn't matter. Yeah, he had a paper on that, said if there's no finance, like foreign and finance in the world, but depression might be better to get to the balance. But the international system needs a stronger banker if there is a finance around that. If the US is to fulfill the rule, the dollar's value must be maintained. Who, who's going to be the, the international banker? So we all choose the world choosing a US dollar. So the dollar value has to be maintained. So Minsky then applied this hedge spec speculative and the Ponzi classification to countries. Kench, different countries are like this, but Ponzi country or speculative country. So the countries with dollar denominated debts need to run a balance of the trade surplus sufficiently <coughs> to service all standing dollar financial, of their financial liability. If you can't, if tier one earning were inefficient, insufficient, the country will be a passive country. That's Minsky adopted this theory into the country level. And with the US operating as the world's banker, it should have to run a continuous tier one trade deficit. Still, the US would have forced the cash flow to itself through one of the other tiers. They have other tiers to help them have the cash inflow, but the deficit, trade deficit must be the same. A rest of the world preference for dollar should keep the dollar strong, and this could require high interest rate and the believable anti-policy, anti-inflation policy. So the rest of the world want your currency. You have to convince them you have a higher interest rate and you don't have higher inflation. That's the convincement. So the net, in, net investment in the U.S. as tier three could also force a dollar reflux. So the dollar will go back to U.S. because the the inter, uh, net investment in the uh, in the U.S. So net flows over tier two. That's net income from U.S. holding of foreign asset could keep the U.S. stronger in face of U.S. trade deficit. Net incomes from U.S. holding a foreign currency, a foreign asset. Because if, you, if U.S. only invested in other countries, they must hold in other foreign currencies' assets. But they need the earnings or revenues back. So at that sense, they can make the U.S. dollar, even they have the trade deficit that make the U.S. dollar stronger. Okay. That's all the means this idea. Um, so today, U.S. trade deficit is much larger relative to GDP than what Minsky was writing. Much larger because the financials. And U.S. had become the world biggest debtor by the end of 2004, net financial assets reached the negative 
uh, 2.5 trillion dollars. Almost all the liabilities are denominated in dollars, but 70% of the assets are in foreign currencies. So is the U.S. a Ponzi unit? Like what means to you just classify is the U.S. a Ponzi unit? Or Minsky apply this term to, we'll, we'll get to the answer about that later. So Minsky applied this term to highly indebted develop, developed nations. However, these are the user of the dollars. They are the external that are largely in dollars. So that problem caused a red on their currency, which depreciate, causing inflation and increase the debt service burden. So those developing countries have their debts, but it's in dollars. US, current, US have their debts, but they have in dollars in their own currencies. So as the issue of the dollar, the US is in a quite different position. It cannot run off the dollar. US, US cannot become Ponzi in its own currencies. Have the debts, but in dollars. Other countries have the debts, but in dollars. But they cannot <laughs> issue the dollars. That's the problem. So the, the U.S. cannot go bankrupt, it, and they are not of a policy country. Uh, so much of the U.S. Uh, private sectors were policy. Well, their country is not a policy country, but their private sector was a policy back to southern states, and so was European private sectors. Cri crisis quickly spread from the U.S., snowballed around the world, and U.S., U.K., China all adopted a very much physical stimulus packages, even though we think it's small, but they all adopted the stimulus packages. U.S. Federal Reserve undertook unprecedented effort to save the global financial system. So because our global financial system is a dollar standard system, we many of the liability and derivatives rate in the dollars. So only the Fed can be the international banker. They can save the system. Uh, not the private system, of, not only the private system, but also the foreign central banks and their banking system. The US has to be responsible for that. So here is the, some data about how US bailed out the financial system or including other countries. Uh, they have the Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg uh, data shows like it's approaching accumulatedly uh, by 2009 November is approaching 29 trillion dollars. The U.S. Fed was trying to save the system putting money in. Here is the uh, the Fed balance sheet when. Uh, when they put, I, I don't know why they won't show up there, but this is the, um, this is the, the crisis period. So you can tell the, the Fed putting a lot of money in there, but then those goes to the QE period. Although, but those $29 trillion that the Fed was trying to save the system, mostly goes to like 84% were just involving the biggest 14, 14 financial institutions. It goes to the big banks. All right, so the, we were question about that. Can it really save the system? They, the, the purpose is good to save the system, but it goes to the biggest financial institutions. Okay, that's about the U.S. I'm not very expert on U.S., but I'm trying to uh, relate the U.S. to China because U.S. dollar is the international reserve currency. How you can tell how much they, are they getting a lot of benefit or they have a lot of responsibility for the whole world. So what about China? If China, China really want to have their currency be uh, internationalizing, how long the way they have to go. So China has their own sovereign currency, that's for sure. 
But sometimes when I was talking, teaching my students, I said, even though we have some, I was, I didn't discuss this with Randy at all, but I think this way, because we have the sovereign currency, but our sovereignty level is a lot lower than U.S. sovereignty level because of exchange rate system. So we operated with a managed currency system, that exchange rate system. China had amassed a sufficient currency, uh, foreign currency reserve to repel the speculation later. So I, I have a friend who we share the same PhD advisor in China. Now he is the head of uh, one of the department in the Chinese central government, just manage all the uh, foreign reserves especially the dollar reserves. So we have the, you know, we use WeChat a lot. And he posted online every day, like how much Chinese international reserve is today, how much increase they are. So because nowadays people are, war sorry, people are all worried about the, the capital outflow. So they like posted online how much their international reserve they have now. So I think now, um, Maybe last month is about three point two trillion dollars. It's a lot bigger than last year. Last year is less than three trillion dollars. So it seems like the international reserve is growing, but the private sector dollars going out. In some sense, capital flows. So there's a report IMF said China probably needs three to four trillion to manage currency if liberalize the capital account. That's the one thing we're trying to do. Oh yeah, the central government and central bank all talking about how even though they don't say that, but I can tell from what they're doing is trying to make their capital account open. Like, so they said three to four trillion. That's why they are so worried about how much international reserve they have. So they can manage those speculations. It, it needs two trillion if it constrains the capital flows. You can tell if it's a lot lesser they need if this constrain the capital flows. So it means these uh, terminology, China is safe. They're not a Ponzi country, they have no currency, they have international reserves. And uh, they're in hedge position now. But their income is some capital flight and downward pressure of RMB. Uh, we, uh, I actually have some graphs, but I, those are in Chinese, <laughs> they can't even transfer to English. So anyway, they're talking about the Chinese currency goes down. In the past like three months, it really depreciated a lot compared to dollar. And they're so much worried about the dollar depreciation. I think real is the same thing, right? They worry about. So international use of the RMB has been slowly rising at the beginning, but now it's a little bit stagnating. So are they still uh, trying to push on them? I think they are. Because they think they, there's a lot of benefit. This um, this is the graph shows at the beginning they pushed really hard. I remember it was 2011. We we all have a conference in Hong Kong. It was organized by um, said George Shores about we have the panel about how that's 2011. That Chinese government started really focus on the internationalization of the RMB. So they push really hard, like the countries around them try to let them use RMB, and they did the government swaps, like between Australia and China and England and China. They have the they have the swaps. Like the government in England, they hold Chinese RMB as their reserves, and then they do the swaps. They, they, they organize those kind of things, but then they start to get in stagnating a little bit. So, uh, is China ready to get their currency internationalizing? And, um, but for, there's only three methods to get your currency to be an in international reserve currency. One is you have to run constantly current account deficit. 
Second, you have to purchase the asset. Use your currency purchasing asset, assets outside the other country. The third is lending. People want to borrow the RMB from your country. Oh, that's the only three way to get, get your currency to be the international reserve currency. So the first requires China to become that importer. The other two require opening capital accounts. So first one, you need China become the net importers. I don't know because the trade war happened between China and the U.S. now. Yeah, it, it actually approaching that. Like Chinese consumers can buy, easily buy the American or other, other countries' products easily, but not because the trade war they tied up. I don't know. And then they become an importer. And the other two require to open a capital account. They really worry about capital outflows. So I don't know about that either. So China must flow the exchange rate to internationalizing their RMB. They have their they need the flow exchange rate. Now, if China doesn't float their currency, international use of RMB commit China to deliver U.S. dollar. Another thing, if you don't have your like exchange rate floating, that even even though other country have your RMB as the international reserve currency, but you have to deliver that into the U.S. dollar because you're not floating. Anyway, if the rest of the world is going to into debt in RMB, it must believe RMB will be available on reasonable terms. But one thing is the borrower must avoid the Ponzi position. That means your in your in, your gross rate must be higher than the interest rate. And the borrower must have access to lender last resort in, in crisis. Who's gonna be the lender of last resort in crisis? Prices if the foreigners have the debt in RMB. Of course, the Chinese central government has to be in the role to do that. So, the conclusion is balances balance. What does that mean? Means government debts are equal to non government surplus. Those are balance. There's a natural balance. And second, government debt is non-government net financial uh, wealth because government debt is like the stocks of a government deficit. So it goes to if government runs debt, uh, debts and they the non-government will have net financial wealth. The current account deficit will be equal to rest of world net financial savings in dollars, for example. So if Chinese won't have their currency internationalization. They need to have the current account deficit. So the rest of the world will have their RMB financial savings. But China now have the current account surplus. Accumulates claim on rest of the world, mostly on dollars. So they have surplus. They have to claim from the rest of the world. So balance balances. So what should China do? Oh, um, so inflation. Uh, here's some inflations of alternative currency regimes. So government is a monopoly supplier of currency. It determines the condition of supply. So they're based on the exchange rate regimes. For first, floating. If you have the floating exchange rate um, system, affordability is never an issue because that's your sovereign currency. And the consequence of too much spending, including inflation, too few resources left for private sector, exchange rate deflation. If you have floating system, they have some concerns. And if you have the manager system, they have additional constraint, like maintenance of the foreign currency, run on currency, currency crisis. But if you have the PAC uh, exchange rate system, they will have even more additional constraints. You might fail to convert your currency to other currencies. So in all those cases, there are always political constraints, operational constraints, myths and misunderstandings. Um, on those three 
um, ideas. So based on where we're talking about the Minsky Ponzi country and the, and the exchange rate regions, and the conclusion for Chinese currency to be internationalizing, we have something below here. So China will gradually trans transition to floating exchange rate. I believe too. So they, as soon as they run out of the, the international reserves, like in dollars, they, they want to transfer to floating exchange rate. And the likely that China's trade surplus will de decline too. They already did, but they were try hard to get an increase. And then can continue to pursue robust growth and rising living standards with its own sovereign currency. Their government has more spaces to do the domestic improvements. And will be able to solve the domestic financial crisis, but should avoid excessive financialization of the economy. So they can to solve their inside financial problem, but they cannot solve too much if they're all financialization. Especially financialization are related to globalization, securitization. So if it's over, it cannot really solve it. We need to increase that, uh, service sector labor productivity, and might one day issue global um, reserve currency, but no hurry. It's not like they. It's not like they don't want to, but they're not ready yet. And so, in short, to the medium term, capital strength and current concept will limit global supply of R&D, that's for sure. And second, issue of global reserve must become a land of last resort in the crisis. So you can tell the Fed lend a lot of money to the global market and then governments, but China's, Chinese government are ready to do that. Um, so question ask, is central government ready to do that? That's what we're talking about. If you couldn't be an international banker, so it must slow down. Okay, that's all for my talk. <laughs> Researches concerning the set of life in China, and what it seems to me is that finally there has been indeed a set of life in 2015 mm -hmm. but apparently it's much lower than what has been shown by the media trying to show that there will be a price, a huge price, a huge price in China. Mm -hmm. Because it's also uh, something related only to a diversification of the external assets in China. So China is investing abroad and trying to... Actually, there are some reports by the office which takes care of the foreign reserves in China. And they say that, well, uh, at the end, they are trying to diversify the way they are uh, having their external assets and so So I'd like to know your opinion if you agree or not with that. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. If I understand right, I know there's like, uh, like two years ago, the Chinese government actually encouraged the company to use the dollar to go outsourcing in other countries. And I think that's, for one thing, they want to do like merge other companies all over the world. They want their currency to be used by other countries. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Another thing, I think by then, um, they all think, uh, by then, we still have a lot of like international reserves, like in dollars, and the people were arguing like so much dollar in account, like we call foreign reserve in the, the central government, the central bank's balance sheet. So that's kind of wasting the, the resource. So they want to use up those foreign reserves to do something, can earn more money instead of just buying the American treasury. That's one idea they wanted people to go to go invest it out. For one thing, they can get people to get used to the 
Chinese RMB and other things, they can get rid of some reserves, which is less beneficial for them. I think that's the, their general idea at the beginning. They want to push that. So, identity is also something that is good for the international engagement. Yeah. And, and the second question uh, uh, concerning the increasing involvement that is in China, because it, it may be seen as for some authors as something bad, but as you showed, since it is in uh, their own currency, they cannot have a report on it. And thinking about the internationalization of the RMB, mm -hmm. uh, my question is if it's not also good for the internationalization of the RMB. Because finally, as you showed, the government debt is the non government financial wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and we see it in, uh, in, in the United States. Uh, the international investors, they are not looking for dollar cash. Mm -hmm. What they have as their reserve, in the reserve asset, is uh, our bid. The uh, Fed uh, bonds. Yeah, bonds. So, in this sense, uh, for the internationalization of the RMB, it will be a good thing for China to have rising government debt, meaning more and more property bonds uh, denominated in RMB. Uh, do you agree with that? I don't know if I was to you. Uh, so, if I. <laughs> let me just. Think about your, so you, your question is if if the Chinese government issue more government bonds, mm -hmm. which is like government debt, mm -hmm. it will help their internationalizing yes. of the R and D. Um, uh, I mean, like for the bond issue in China, for the central government side, they they believe the bond. Issued is related to the some companies or some project that need the money, so they issue the bond to collecting the money for them to use it. But they didn't think about that way. For now, I mean, for them, the currency for the people who can holding the bonds mm -hmm. in China in, in Chinese currency. So I think they started to think about it, but they are not too much going on yet. I think that might be a good idea, but I'm not sure. Like, like the investor will think about Chinese bond is good investment or not. That's one thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. I'd like to thank you for the explanation and your lecture. Uh, but I, I, would, I would like to to to, to ask you. If uh, the relationship between uh, the Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. uh, looks like a, a, a huge plan to, to solve a lot of problems in China, mm -hmm. for example, the water capacity on mm -hmm. one side, on the other side, there, there is a, a question of imbalance between the regions inside China that is mm -hmm. part of the Mm -hmm. Proposal of mm -hmm. the world, but also the idea of have some infrastructure projects around uh, Asia and Africa and Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of this project, we need finance. And the role of the Gulf banks of China is uh, probably is very important, mm -hmm. even considering the Asian Development Bank. And Mm -hmm. Bank. Yeah. I think that it's not sufficient and the, the role of the two banks is important. Uh, do you think that it could be a, a way of to, to advance in this process of internationalization of women be uh, in a more controlled and common way? Uh, because it's more related with the regional women and you mean like uh, do you think that the the, the, the Belton Road it's also a way to, to promote the internationalization of women here or um, yeah. I think as long as the Chinese government is still pursuing the 
uh, current account surplus, including the capital flow constraint, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard for the internationalization of r and no matter what they do inside of the country. I think that's the key issue. So they're, they're, So a lot of people actually were complaining about uh, Chinese government was so generous. They gave the too much dollar, dollar assets or whatever they had reserves to other poor countries to help them to develop, and they wouldn't like a central government. I mean, they, they mean central government wouldn't like give issue a lot of debts and help the domestic household or economies. So I think there's just there they have the belief they have to have the international reserve to maintain their currency. They they have to have the a current account surplus. That's their belief. So if they still have that belief, no matter what they did, hold on, inside of the country, I think we can understand. Yeah. So, um, um, so thank you uh, for your presentation again. And uh, um, we were discussing the uh, possibilities of the internationalization of Renmin. Mm -hmm. And uh, at a certain point, you mentioned that uh, for uh, that to happen, it's necessary to. Uh, to open the capital account, and uh, you have mentioned that uh, you are increasingly, I mean, China is increasingly, um, let's say, in, in the process of financialization. Mm -hmm. And um, but I'd like uh, to hear a little bit more about the role that uh, Hong Kong plays in the in the financial uh, system uh, in China because um, for us at least, for me at least, uh, there is this hypothesis or mm -hmm. that uh, in, in, Hong Kong, in Hong Kong you can play all the games, you know, and in China you, you still can, can do that, it's much more controlled than that. And this sense Hong Kong would be like a lamp for the um, more risky and more like effective uh, financial operations and everything. And uh, so this, this is the, that's my question, the, the relation and then the role that is Hong Kong. Yes, I mean. Yeah, for Hong Kong, you know their exchange rate system, is, we call that uh, like, like, they are strictly packed to the US dollars. So the US dollar floating, their Hong Kong yuan will floating. You know the exchange rate system. So they pack to dollars, the Hong Kong Hong Kong yuan. But um, but Chinese, so the Chinese central government or central bank, they don't have too much power or control on the Hong Kong. On Hong Kong yuan, because they have their own currencies, they they pack to the dollars. But they, one thing, I don't think the Chinese central government at the beginning was trying to use the Hong Kong as the platform to let people let the currency put the RMB there, let people think the investors think they do they want the dollar RMB or not. At the beginning, they were they were doing the test on that, but then. People think, oh, Hong Kong is a good, inter it's an international like financial center. So their currency can easy to exchange or whatever. So they they put the they trying to change the RMB in Hong Kong to other currencies, which is actually caused a lot of capital outflows from Hong Kong. So the, now they are trying to block something. They're working together with the Hong Kong government and try to think about how to do that. Even though it's hard, because they are afraid that their system is floating, they packed it to the US dollar. So they were, in China, like, for example, if your kids was having school in US, and you want to transfer some dollars 
from RMB to dollar to send it to them, you should have a lot of document demonstrate that you, you are there and they will give you a limit by how much living expenses there, how much the duration is, then they will transfer your RMB. But if you move, you can move your money to Hong Kong, it's a lot easier. But they are watching because you either bring the cash to into the Hong Kong, that's harder, or you just put your money in the bank, they, they are watching you. I think, yeah, at the beginning they were trying to use the Hong Kong as the like a platform, yeah, but now they're a little bit alert.